Peter and Pam Kelly won a Northland Balance Farm Environment Supreme Award, despite the intensive grazing management system they use. They bought their farm on the west coast of Northland in the 1970s and began planting trees from day one. We've got a 300 hectare coastal sand farm. Of that, about 240 hectares is effective. We've got, I think, 40 hectares of plantation forest and the other 20 odd hectares is shelter belts, or wetlands and dams and stuff. We run 800 head of cattle. We're exclusively a, a cattle farm. We were sheep farming, but they were sort of unprofitable for us. And we've got into this intensive beef system. And of those 800 cattle, 200 of them are dairy cows, about 200 of them are two-year-old bulls, and the remaining 400 are a mixture of steers, heifers, and yearlings. We've tried to make the most out of the kaikuya by going into an intensive beef farm and we can deal with it. And it's to the stage now where I think it's an asset rather than a liability. The sand is actually very free draining, so it's great for the winter. And beef farming, I think you probably make most of your money in the winter time, and we can maximise the advantage of the sand by doing that. When it came here, this farm had some low tea tree in the valleys, and we were encouraged to cut that down. But we'd come from Mangawai, and we'd had a block of native bush, and we just really missed the tall trees in the native bush. And we started trying to plant things that would grow, and we found the salt laden and western winds were making it difficult. So we sort of had to do barriers. We'd put in a tree that would grow and then put something in the shade of that tree. And we found banksias are very good, banksias. We've planted poplars along the east-west, so the shading is not shading in winter. And on the north-south, we've planted more evergreen trees that will break this wind from the west. And we've had good success with banksias, with pahutakawas, and we've planted margarita poplars, which are tougher for us. And we've planted alders and willows. And we have fun trying to plant little blocks of native trees, anything we think might grow, we trial and hope it does grow. We envy people who have got a farm full of totaras because we find it very difficult to grow totaras here. They get salt damage from the wind. We are trying to fence off the wetlands, the water's edges, to stop the cattle getting close to the water and dirtying it. And we're just putting in some cabbage trees just to sort of put a bit of shelter and shade up there and just to protect the stream bed from cattle and from the silt coming down, just to trap the silt so it doesn't get into the waterways. We do have erosion issues because the sand is quite movable. We, we were very reluctant to go into having bull farming because bulls tend to make these big wallowing places. But Peter's got this way of going along with the rotary hoe afterwards and flattening them out. We try to put the heavier cattle in places where they can't do as much damage. So on the hillsides we put lighter cattle and on the heavier country we can put the heavier cattle. When we moved here, we got into the idea of having electric fencing, and we found the electric fencing was really good, but it gave us the opportunity to put in more plants. And if we had a seven wire post and batten fence, we found the salt wind was eroding the wires, and we are putting up a barrier of flaxes to protect the wire of the good fences, and they became a shelter in themselves and a windbreak. There's a mob of one-year-old steers and bulls. The policy pretty much is with the beef cattle that we buy in calves from weaning, that's about November, right through until about May, sort of like 100 kilos to 150 kilos. They'll be on the farm two winters, these cattle. Next year they'll be two-year-olds and they'll be slaughtered as two-and-a-half-year-olds before Christmas. So at any one time, half the beef cattle here are this age and the other half are well, the equivalent of these from last year. These guys get shifted every two days, as does everything on the farm. We try to keep it simple. Every second day, we come out on the field, Pam and I, and we spend about three hours shifting, and then that's it for a day and a half. At the moment, we're getting very small growth rates over the winter. The idea is that you um, uh, rely on this compensatory growth, so you're carrying really too many, or you're almost overstocked for the winter. 
so you've got enough stock on hand for the spring and they compensate then and they grow really well then. The, the bigger cattle will do about two kilograms a day in the spring and almost none now. These guys here will actually, the calves actually have to put a little bit of weight on because they are calves and they'll go from the 100 kilos we bought them at I guess to uh, about 400 kilos by May next year and then they will, by the following Christmas they will reach about 600. So we're buying them at 100 and we're selling them at 600 kilos or 300 kilos carcass weight. I went to a field day up at Aranga to a, a farm that was being running, run by Bernard, who's sort of subsequently come to work here, and he had put in a techno system on the block that he managed there. And I was very impressed with that, and I came home and I thought, well, I badly needed answers to a few problems, and that solved one, the Kaikuya. I thought if we had this intensive beef system on Kaikuya, we would knock it into shape. And the other thing I thought was obviously profitability. He had a, a farm with less fertility than I had, and he was producing more beef per hectare. He had more grass than I had, and the whole system seemed to be running really well. So we tried a little system ourselves. We put in several lanes. We weighed the cattle onto those lanes, so we knew how many hectares there was. And we had a control, which was up here, coincidentally. At the end of 12 months, we'd been producing about 220 kilograms of uh, carcass weight on the control and we were doing about 450. We did about 450 on the, the bit that we'd technoed with no better pastures. It was just the, um, the grazing management. So after that, that gave us the confidence to get really stuck in and we surveyed, I think, techno surveyed probably 50 or 60 hectares the following year. Pretty nearly half the farmers surveyed into techno and the other half is either surveyed into cell blocks or in, into something very similar. So now we've got, for simplicity partly, every animal on the farm is on a two-day rotation. Everything, we know how many kilograms we're putting of um, live weight we put on each hectare at the start of the winter, which is in about April or May. Virtually every hectare now is intensively run. There probably isn't a lot of flexibility. You've, you're running it fairly finely. The thing breathing down our neck really is the, the summer drought and we've got to keep that in the back of our mind. We've got to start getting weight onto these animals fairly early in the spring and by November we've got to have at least 100 of these things ready to go. And uh, I think of it as a, a sinking lid policy. Before Christmas, as it's getting drier, we've got stuff moving out all the time. And if we get caught a little bit and it's drier than we expected it to be, we may have to sell some animal store. <coughs> This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.